Welcome back to the fifth and last section of chapter six. In this section, we're going to be looking at logistic growth and something else called partial fraction decomposition. This is another one of those sections that is BC only. So you can feel a little bit special about this. Um, as a topic goes, it's not one of the biggest, most important topics out there, but it is still good to know, and it does kind of pop up in some random places. Our learning targets, we're going to complete partial fraction decompositions, evaluate integrals, solve differential equations involving logistic growth, analyze populations that grow logistically, and solve initial value problems using partial fractions. So, first of all, we're looking to see how populations grow. In the last section, we were looking at exponential growth and decay, which has stuff going like that. It's growing exponentially. And we look at like, oh, the bacterial culture, it's growing exponentially. It's like, well, yeah, to a point. However, at some point, it's going to hit the carrying capacity of whatever system it's living in. Like if you have a little petri dish that can only really support a million bacteria, it's not going to get 10, 12, 20 million. It's going to get to 1 million. Um, same thing with any kind of um, any kind of system. If you know on Kamano Island we have uh, coyotes. How many coyotes does, can the island support? I don't know, let's say 50. More than that, and they run out of room, they run out of food, they run out of other stuff. And so um, we get that carrying capacity. So generally speaking, when populations grow, it's not entirely exponential. It's logistic. It's going to start out exponential growth but then it turns into exponential decay ish I mean it's, it's approaching this other horizontal asymptote so it's actually bounded both above and below by horizontal asymptotes it's bounded below because you can't have less than zero creatures in a population that just doesn't work out. And then the carrying capacity gets it above. And so that's what's called logistic growth. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. But before we can really get to dealing with the logistic growth, we have to deal with some partial fractions. We have to see what's going on here. So, what partial fractions are is we have these bigger fractions that we're going to have to deal with. We're going to end up having to take the antiderivative of these. Now we have um, integration by parts to deal with the product rule, but we don't really have anything to deal with the quotient rule. So what we're going to do is we're going to break these into pieces with linear denominators. Now what's important is the the degree of the denominator is bigger than the degree of the numerator. When it's not, we'll deal with that separately and we'll see that in a minute. Um, but we have the degree of the denominator is 2 here and the degree of the numerator is 1. So we can break this into pieces using linear um, binomials in the denominator. The very first thing we need to do is we need to factor the denominator. So f of x equals x minus 13 over. Uh, so let's see, we're going to have a 2x and an x. Let's see, 3 and 1, multiply the 2 by 3 to get 6. So the 3 will be over here, and the 1. And they both need to be negative, so to make a minus 7 and a plus 3. So, we factored the denominator. Now, 
the idea behind partial fractions is we're going to split this up using addition. You might be thinking like, wait a second, split it up using addition. If you think we're usually adding the two fractions together, and so we need common denominators. Splitting them up, this, what we have, is the common denominator. But we could 2x minus 1 and x minus 3. We could split this up to be something over 2x minus 1 plus something over x minus 3. We don't know what these are. This is not x and negative 13. I want to make that very clear. That is not how that works. We're going to just call them a and b for now. So now we have to think about adding them back together. Like what would we do to make the common denominator? We would take this a and we'd have to multiply it by x minus 3 plus the b times 2x minus 1. And when we add that together, it's going to equal the denominator, which is x minus 13. Now, when I've always done this, I have always made a system of equations. I'd multiply it out. So like we have ax minus 3a plus 2bx minus b. Well, the x's have to get add together to give x. The constants have to add together to give negative 13. It gives us a system of equations. Um, what our text does is really quite slick. Um, it says we're going to make x equal 3. So we're going to plug in 3 minus 13 equals a times 3 minus 3. That's 0. That's why I chose 3, by the way. It's going to make that 0. Plus b. 2 times 3 minus 1. So 3 minus 13 is negative 10 equals that 0. So we have 6b minus 1 is 5b. So we can divide to get b equals negative 2. And then we can make x equal 1 half because 1 half is what will make that second one equal to zero. So we'll have one half minus 13 equals a times one half minus three plus b times zero. So one half minus 13 is negative 12 and a half. We're gonna have to divide though. So that, let's make that negative um, 25 halves equals 1 half minus 3 is negative 2 and a half. So let's make that negative 5 halves. A, we can flip and multiply to get A equals 5. So now we have B, we have A. We're just going to take this equation again and put in a so we have 5 over 2x minus 1 plus negative 2 or we could go minus 2 over x minus 3 and that is f of x if we multiply if we made our common denominator and added them together we would get x minus 13 over that denominator um, and so that's partial fraction decomposition is what it's called. Um, and from here, we could find the antiderivatives of each of those. We'd end up with natural logs of stuff, but we could do that. And then we can combine our natural logs. We're going to see that in the next problem. Um, but so partial fraction decomposition f of x equals p of x over q of x, where they're polynomials, and the degree of the top is less than the degree of the bottom, um, then it can be, if q of x can be written as a product of distinct linear factors, then 
um, we can write it as a sum of rational functions with the distinct linear uh, denominators. So we can do what we just did. So let's take another one. Here we're going to find the antiderivative. So first, we're going to have to split this up. But notice the degree of the top here is bigger than the degree of the bottom. We're going to have to divide. So we go back to our long division, 3x to the fourth. Then we have 0x cubed, 0x squared, 0x's, plus 1. Now we're going to divide by x squared minus 1. So when we're dividing, we take that first number, that x squared, x squared times what equals 3x to the fourth? That would be 3x squared. We multiply that, so we get 3x to the fourth minus 3x squared. This is x cubed, x squared, x. So we're going to put that minus 3x squared. Um, stack it so that when we subtract, we're not combining non-like terms, because then we subtract this whole thing. The 3x to the fourth is going to have to cancel. That's kind of the idea here. Distribute that negative. So we end up with 3x squared. Then we can bring down everything else. Now, x squared times what equals 3x squared? Well, that's... 3. Multiply. We have 3x squared minus 3. Subtract. And so we get to distribute that. 4. And so this will be plus 4 over x squared minus 1. Now, we can find the antiderivative of this. The problem here, we're going to be finding the antiderivative of 3x squared plus 3 plus 4 over x squared minus 1. We can split this up into pieces. 3x squared dx plus the antiderivative of 3dx plus the antiderivative of 4 over x squared minus 1 dx. Now those first two are going to be easy enough to find. That last one though, we can't do that at the moment. So we have to split it up into our partial fractions. So that's what we're going to do. We can factor the denominator. So 4 over x squared minus 1 is going to be 4 over x minus 1 times x plus 1, which means we can split that up into something over x minus 1 plus something over x plus 1. When we make our common denominators, a times x plus 1 plus b times x minus 1 is going to have to equal 4. So we can let x equal negative 1. There's no x on this side, so we have 4 equals 0 plus b times negative 2, so negative 2b. Divide b equals negative 2. And then we can let x equal positive 1. So 4 would equal a times 2 plus 0. So a equals positive 2. And so we get um, our our split fractions will have 2 over x minus 1. Um, I'm going to say minus 2 over x plus 1. That we're going to have to find the, der the antiderivative of, but we can split that up now. So 
if we write our problem way up here at the top we have the antiderivative of 3x squared dx plus the antiderivative of 3dx plus the antiderivative of 2 over x minus 1 dx plus the antiderivative of, no minus the antiderivative of 2 over x plus 1 dx. So the 3x squared, well that's x cubed plus 3x and then the 2 could actually come out in front. So I'm going to, we're going to do this in two steps. So that's going to be plus 2 and I drive 1 over x minus 1 dx minus 2 times the of 1 over x plus 1 dx. 1 over something like that is going to give us a natural log. So that's plus 2 natural log of x minus 1. So if we take the derivative of natural log of x minus 1, we get 1 over x minus 1 times the derivative of x, which is 1, checks out minus 2 times natural log of x plus 1. Um, then we'll have a plus c in there. We can combine these now. The the 2s here in the natural log could, can't, could factor out. So we have x cubed plus 3x plus 2 natural log x minus 1 minus natural log x plus 1 plus c. And then our log properties, when we subtract logs, that means we could divide the inside. x cubed plus 3x plus 2 natural log of x minus 1 over x plus 1 plus c. So that is how we can use the um, the the partial fraction decomposition to be able to find the antiderivative. We have to split stuff up, then we start getting natural logs of stuff. We can combine those. Uh, remember when we add, that means we can combine them and multiply the insides. When we divide, we combine them and divide the insides. Or when we subtract, we combine, divide the insides. So, we found that. So another one. Um, this one, we're going to find the general solution. So y equals, so same thing we just did. It's just coming at us a little bit differently. Um, and this one, we have three factors in the denominator because the x squared minus 4 is going to change. So here is where my method of doing it got really hard because all of a sudden we have a system of three equations and three variables to solve. The way we're doing it now, it's about the same. It's really not much different. It's really nice. So the very first step is we're going to factor that denominator, which is x plus 2, x minus 2, and we'll still have that x minus 1. So we can split this up, 6x squared minus 8x minus 4 over x squared minus 4 times x minus 1 is going to equal something over x plus 2 plus something over x minus 2 plus something over x minus 1. And so we can multiply again. So our common denominators, we'd have to multiply by the other two. So we'd have a times x minus 2 x plus 1 minus 1 plus b x plus 2 x minus 1 plus c, x plus 2, 
x minus 2. That would be what the numerator would end up having to be. And that's going to have to equal 6x squared minus 8x minus 4. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to plug in negative 2. We're going to plug in positive 2. And we're going to plug in positive 1. Because that's what would make each of these original denominators 0. And so it'll cancel out our variables here. So first, let's start out with x equals negative 2. So we do need to plug it in to this side. So we're going to have 6 times negative 2 squared minus 8 times negative 2 minus 4 equals a negative 2 minus 2 is negative 4. Um, negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. And then plus b. We're going to have negative 2 plus 2, that's 0. So b is going to be 0. And c, we're going to have negative 2 plus 2, so c is going to be 0. So we only have to worry about a here. So on the other side, um, negative 2 squared is 4 times 6 is 24 plus 16 minus 4 is going to equal 12a. 24 plus 16 minus 4 is going to be 36 equals 12a. So a equals 3. All right, now let's plug in x equals positive 2. So we'll have 6 times 2 squared minus 8 times 2 minus 4 equals, in this case, the a is going to be a 0 because we'll have x 2 minus 2. The b will have 2 plus 2 times 2 minus 1. And then the c will be 0. So simplifying, 2 squared is 4 times 6 is 24 minus 16 minus 4 equals, this is 4 times 1, so this is 4b. 24 minus 16 minus 4 is 4 equals 4b. So b equals 1. And then we can plug in to solve for c. So we'd plug in x equals 1. And we'll get 6 times 1 squared minus 8 times 1 minus 4 equals c times 1 plus 2 is 3, 3, 1 minus 2 is negative 1. So 6 minus 8 minus 4 is negative 6 equals negative 3c. So c equals 2. So we can rewrite our fractions. dy over dx equals a over x plus 2, so that's 3 over x plus 2, plus b, which is 1 over x minus 2, plus 2 over x minus 1. So now we can deal with our differential equation, separate our variables, which basically just means multiplying the dx over to the other side. So we have dy will equal... 3 over x plus 2 plus 1 over x minus 2 plus 2 over x minus 1 dx. Take the antiderivatives of both sides to get y equals. We can do each of them separately, and we can factor out that, that constant on top. So we'll have 3 natural log of x plus 2 plus 1 natural log x minus 2 plus 2 natural log x minus 1 plus c. Um, and then we can combine them. But in this case, we can't factor out that initial constant because they're not all the same. So those need to go into exponents. So we'll have y equals natural log of x plus 2 to the third 
plus natural log of x minus 2 plus natural log of x minus 1 squared plus c. Now we can combine them. It's all addition. So we just multiply. So y equals natural log of x plus 2 cubed x minus 2 x minus 1 squared plus c. So um, <clears throat> that would be one with three denominators or three factors in the denominator, which is a bit of a bit of a complicated problem, but we can do it. It uses the same stuff as with two. Um, and so this brings us to our logistic differential equation. So a logistic differential equation is the same basic idea as an exponential differential equation in that it's directly proportional to the y value. Um, so we're probably talking population here. So the rate of change of the population is directly proportional to the population. However, it has that limiting factor, which is m minus p, um, which keeps it from going beyond. That's that horizontal asymptote, where m would be the horizontal asymptote. That is the limit. So we can, we could solve for this. We can separate our variables. So we can divide 1 over p times m minus p dp equals kdt. We can find the antiderivative. Before that, though, we have to split up, find our partial fractions. So, well, it's p and m minus p, so we'll have a over p plus b over m minus p. We'll have to equal 1 over p times m minus p. So we can multiply to find our common denominators, a times m minus p plus bp will have to equal 1. Um, so we'd plug in m We'd plug in P equals M to get B M equals one. So B would be one over M. It's easier when that's actually a number. Um, and the P is a little bit tougher to, to deal with there um, because we don't have we, we don't have M as a number, so so finding it um, algebraically like this is a little bit tough. So we're going to look at something where we do have numbers. Um, this one, we won't actually find it with this one, but we'll answer some questions. So the growth rate of a population uh, of bears in a newly established wildlife preserve is modeled by the differential equation dp over dt equals 0.08p times 100 minus p. So notice it actually gives us these these values, which is nice. Um, where t is measured in years. What is the carrying capacity for bears in the wildlife preserve? The carrying capacity is that m. It's right there. So a would be 100 bears. And then what is the bear population when the population is growing the fastest? Remember, logistic curves look like that. The slope is steepest right in the middle. So it'll be half of that, about 50 bears. And then what is the rate of change of the population when it is growing the fastest? The rate of change is the dp over dt equals uh, 0.008 times 50 
times 100 minus 50. So 100 minus 50 is 50, times 50 is 2,500, times 0 0.008 should be about 20. bears per year. So at its fastest, it should be getting at about 20 bears per year in its growth rate. So that one we didn't actually have to do the anti-differentiation, but we'll do it on this one. So in 1985 and 1987, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources airlifted 61 moose from Algonquin Park, Ontario, into Marquette County in the Upper Peninsula. It was originally hoped that the population P would reach a carrying capacity in about 25 years, with a growth rate. Notice they give us that equation again, dP over dt equals 0 0.0003P times 1000 minus P. Um, so, according to the model, what is the carrying capacity? A, well, again, that's just that number right there. 1,000 moose. Um, with a calculator, generate a slope field for the differential equation. Um, with a calculator, you have to program it, but we've done it with a Desmos. Um, having a slope field and for the differential equation and then graphing your your general equation or your specific equation onto it is a good way of checking to make sure nothing horrible happened in the process. So graphing, we get that, which that's what a logistic curve looks like. It's going to come up and curve. So I don't know if that's where it's going to be. I'm going to erase that, but that's what it should look like. Um, then solve the differential equation with the initial condition p of not equals p of zero equals 61 and show that it conforms to the slope field so solving this we're going to start out by separating our variables so we'll have 1 over p times 1000 minus p dp equals 0 0.000 3 dt. We have to split up those fractions. Um, and so we're going to have a over p. Uh, 1 over p times 1000 is p. Have to be a over p plus b over 1000 thousand minus p and so when we multiply we'll have to have a times 1000 minus p plus bp will have to equal 1 and so if we set p to 0 that'll get rid of the bp we get 1 equals 1,000 A. We divide, so 1 over 1,000 will equal A, um, which is 0 0.00. zero one one thousand. There we go. Um, and then we can make equal to 1,000 and so we'd get 1 equals 1,000 B so we can divide so B also equals 1 1,000th Yes, so they're both equal to the same. So we could rewrite our fractions as 0 0.001 over P plus 0 0.001 over 1000 minus P 
dp equals 0 0.0003 dt. And then we can find the antiderivative of both sides. So the 0 0.001 over p, it's going to be a point. We're going to go, uh, we can go right below for this point. 0 0.001 natural log of p. Um, and then we'll have a 0 0.001 one natural log of 1000 minus p but when we take the derivative we get 1 over 1000 minus p times the derivative of that which that minus p turns into negative 1 so this needs to be negative and then it's going to equal 0 0.0003 t plus c. So we can factor out that point zero zero one, or we can multiply everything, the whole thing by 1000. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do it up here. So multiply by 1000, we get natural log of p minus natural log of 1000 minus p equals multiply by 1,000, so we're going to move 1, 2, 3, so 0.3t plus c, because 1,000 times an unknown constant is still just an unknown constant. Now, these two c's are not the same. This one's 1,000 times more than the other one, but that doesn't matter because we still don't know what it is. Now, we can combine our fraction. So we have natural log of p over 1,000 minus p equals 0.3t plus c. And we can go e to the power, e to the power. So we get p over 1,000 minus p equals, we're, I'm going to split up that e to the c is c e to the point three t and then um, we can split up to have that on the other side. Oh well. There was an easier way of doing this where we switched the signs and ended up with this 1000 minus p over p and then we were able to split up the fraction, made it easier. We're going to multiply this over to the other side. We'll do it the hard way. Um, and when we do that we can um, distribute as well. So we'll have 1000 c e to the point 3 t minus p c e to the point 3 t. We can add that over to the other side and factor it out. So we'll have 1 plus c e to the point 3 t equals the 1000 c e to the point 3 t and we can divide to get p equals 1000 then we have c e to the point 3 t over 1 plus c e to the point 3 t but
we have that can cancel though. This is why it becomes more difficult doing it this way, being that I missed that step earlier. Because I can factor out, oh yes, we can factor out the c to the point 3t. I am out of room. Um, we're going to move it to right over here. P equals, we're going to have 1000 C E to the point three T over C E to the point three T. Um, times one over that, which would be one over C E to the negative point three T because it's in the denominator there plus one. Then that cancels. So 1000 over one over C, that's still just an unknown constant. I'm going to call it C. Now the other ones are gone. E to negative 0.3 T plus 1. That was disgusting. All right, and then if when P naught, so when T equals 0, the population is 61, so we can solve for C. So this is a general equation, but we can plug in 61 equals... 1000 over C, when T is zero, that's E to the zero, which is one plus one. We could multiply it over to get 61 C plus 61 equals 1000. Subtract the 61 equals 1000 minus 61. It's gonna be 939 divide by 61 to get C equals like 15.393 or so. And then we're gonna plug that back into that equation. So our population is gonna be 1000 over 15.393 E to the negative 0.3 T plus one. Boy, the good news is we're going to have a formula for this here in just a second. So you do not have to do that every single time because, as you can see, it takes a lot of room. And there are a lot of places that could become very problematic and end in disaster. And this is why it's a good idea to check this equation with the slope field to see if it makes sense. So if we type in this equation into our slope field and we graph it, we get that it looks like that, which goes along with the slope field. If we made a mistake, we would get something that does not look like it would go along with the slope field. Like it wouldn't be like, oh, all right, that's kind of close. It would be very much different. So. Yeah. That, that's a mess. Um, but we have logistic growth models because if we take that differential equation and we find the general equation, we get P equals M, which is a carrying capacity. We had 1000, notice that was in the top, over one plus a, the constant, times e to the negative mk times um, t. So we can use that and not have to find it. 
every single time. Which, from the last slide, you know, that's a good thing. So, if we look at one, it says the growth of a population of Aurora, Colorado between 1950 and 2003 was roughly logistic, satisfying the differential equation, um, dp over dt equals p times 0.1 minus 3.125 times 10 to the negative seventh p. Model the growth with, with the logistic function using the initial condition p of naught equals uh, 2 or p of 0 equals 12,800. So we need one thing really. Well, two things we have k and we have m that are in this equation. So we have m minus p on the inside here. Well, we don't really have m minus p. We have something minus something times p. So we really need to factor out what's being multiplied by p. So we have dp over dt equals p times um, we're going to factor out this whole uh, 3.125 times 10 to the negative seventh. And what that's going to leave us with is something minus P. So when we factor that out, we have to divide 0.1 by that number. And when we do, we get 320,000. So we get 320,000 minus P. So this is now just multiplied to the outside. This is K and this is M. We can plug that in. P equals M, 320,000 over 1 plus a, we don't know that yet, e to the negative mk, well, when we multiply m times k, like we just, m times k, that's going to get us right back to this number right here. So we have negative 0.1 times t. We can plug in our initial condition. So the population is going to be 12,800 equals 320,000 over 1 plus a to the, when we plug in 0 there, that's just e to the 0, which is 1. So that we can multiply this over to get 800 plus the 12,800a equals the 32,000. We can subtract and then divide. So a will equal two, 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 minus 12,800 divided by the 12,800, which is So we get P equals 320,000 over 1 plus 24 E to the negative 0.1 T. And that was way easier than having to do the um, then to do the anti-differentiation with the partial fractions and stuff like that. So I'd recommend doing it this way, if at all possible. Um, 
And then at that point, it might ask you questions like, when is the population going to be whatever number? Or what's the population after this many years? Or things like that. Um, it is always a good idea to check the, uh, the equation with the slope field. So if we graph them both, we get that, which that looks like it matches. So that seems to be a good a good model. Didn't make any th any horrible mistakes on that. Um, so this was logistic growth models um, and partial differential or partial fraction decomposition. Um, Again, it's not the most important topic in the world, but it does come up, so it's good to know. And sometimes partial fractions come up um, just out of nowhere, so just have to be aware. Um, I will see you in class, though. But until then, keep working problems, keep asking questions, and as always, happy mathing.